Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Melissa Vogel. Melissa is the business owner and operator of Melissa Vogel Fitness, LLC. She's a fitness expert with 20 plus years of experience as a certified personal trainer and group fitness instructor. As the creator of Busy to Bomb Fit Mom, she helps busy moms get back to being fit through mindset, work, vision, and balance combined with proper nutrition and exercise. As the host of the Bomb Mom podcast, she entertains many different speakers, including me, over several topics in order to broaden listeners' ideals of what healthy really is and to inspire listeners to find new avenues to set, reach, and maintain their goals. She's also a motivational speaker, author of the Bomb Mom mom recipe book, model actress, and an overall busy mom of three girls that continues to inspire women on their fitness journey. So today we're diving deep into an often overlooked but profoundly impactful topic, childhood betrayal. My guest, Melissa Vogel, is here to share her powerful story of growing up in an environment marked by infidelity, emotional neglect, and the challenging journey of healing. Melissa didn't just survive the past, she transformed it into a driving force for change, personal empowerment, and helping others. In this conversation, we explore how betrayal during childhood shapes self-worth, how Melissa broke free from toxic cycles, and how physical strength became a catalyst for her emotional recovery. If you're ready to hear about resilience, transformation, and how to rise above adversity, you're gonna love this conversation. Here we go. Hi, it's Dr. Debbie. If you're a coach, therapist, or health professional, listen up. I know you've seen it before. The deep pain and emotional wounds that come from betrayal. It's heartbreaking, but I'm here to tell you, you can make a real difference. Imagine having the tools to guide your clients through their healing process, helping them move past the devastating effects of betrayal and into a life of transformation. That's exactly why I created the Certified P coach practitioner program. And I want to invite you to a free masterclass to show you exactly how it works. In just one hour, you'll learn how to expand your expertise, grow your practice, and most importantly, help people who are desperate for this kind of healing. This isn't just another certification. This is an opportunity to change lives. So what are you waiting for? Grab your spot in my free masterclass at thepbtinstitute.com forward slash certification masterclass. You're just one step away from making an enormous impact. I can't wait to see you there. Okay, everybody, we are with Melissa Vogel today. And you know, she's just one of these rock stars and you will absolutely see for yourself. But the reason why I wanted her on the show is because out of all of the episodes we've had, we have never focused on this topic, yet it is something that happens to so many of us. We're gonna talk about what it's like growing up with betrayal and what, of course, more importantly, what to do about it. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, thanks for having me on. Of course. So it was so interesting because when I was on your amazing podcast, we had this great conversation. And then after we were we were done, we were talking a little bit. And when you mentioned you were sort of, you know, you grew up in this environment, I couldn't believe I never had an episode on that. And seeing what you've done with it and who you've become now, I was like, we just have to have to talk about this. So thank you. Thank you for coming on. Let's just let's just get started with with the beginning, right? What was it like? Tell us what it was like growing up in that environment. Let's just start there. Yeah, it's, you know, that's a lot that I have to focus on now as an adult, which no one warned me about. I thought it'd just be fine. My parents actually stayed married. Um, but as a child growing up in that, I grew up always on edge. I was always anxious no shocker that I had ADHD too, which, you know, which came first, did the anxiety cause the ADHD or the, was the ADHD causing the anxiety, you know, but it was an environment where I saw my mom always stressed out, always just 
focusing on my dad, which then me and my siblings kind of got left on the back burner, you know, um, because she was always wondering, where is he? Who is he with? What's he doing? And then when he was home, all her focus was on him, you know, probably trying to make him happy and stuff. And that that was tough because that left me and my siblings to fend for ourselves. You know, while this betrayal was going on, there was these kids myself like going hey is anyone paying attention to me you know so i and then i took on the role of like well i have to keep everything going you know i i watched my brothers a lot um i kept things just going on and then when my mom was upset i took on the role of taking care of her of just like mom are you okay and then it transformed into me never wanting to leave my mom's side so if my aunt and uncle wanted to take us um you know to get us out of the house and i would cry and scream and be so upset because i didn't want to leave my mom because i didn't know what was going to happen while i was gone and who was going to take care of my mom as like this nine-year-old little girl and it it was just a constant worry and Are we going to have dinner tonight? Is mom going to pick me up from school today? Is dad going to be around? Is he going to pay attention to me? It was never like, you're a child, relax, (laughs) you know, enjoy your childhood. You don't have to worry about these things. And people don't think about all these other things that are going on caused from a betrayal and that disruption in a marriage. Now, did you know when you were a little kid, did you know that it was betrayal or did you think your mom was just anxious just because that's who she was? Did you like, did you know what was happening? Good question. When I was younger, so less than a teenager, probably, I didn't know. I just thought that my dad was very demanding and my mom, you know, just that's what she did. That's just how you act as a woman and as a wife, you know, and then later on, my mom would send me into bars and bowling alleys to go look for my dad. And so I remember being a child small because I remember like walking around and everyone was so much bigger than me. And she would send me in to go find my dad to see if he was in there, who he was talking to. And then it started clicking like, Oh, he's in there. He's in there with someone else. And then he got real gutsy and he would play like basketball and stuff. So I would go to those basketball games with him, And one of the girlfriends was there. And then I saw my dad say goodbye to her and I'll never forget that memory. And I was like, Oh, now you're really getting gutsy. I didn't realize it at the time, but I can remember it now. And then I definitely knew dad was talking to someone else. Oh, 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 this is what's happening. So you, you kids are only, you know, quote unquote, dumb for so long, you know, naive for so and long. Not dumb at all. Yeah, of course. You were just trusting in, in what mm-hmm. you thought should have been a relationship between your mom and your dad. So before you knew then, what did you make of that? Because I guess, you know, what happens is it's like, if, if we see our parents acting a certain way and we're little, we assume it must be us. You know, we must be the reason why we're not good enough. We're mm-hmm. not this enough, that enough. What, what beliefs were formed then for you? Like what, what meaning did you give that before you knew oh, what your dad was doing? Girl, you hit the nail on the head. Um, not enoughness, unworthy of that attention and, and that love. And that re- really transpired later as an adult. Um, and I'm still going through it and working through it of like being enough and accepting that love. Um, and realizing I always thought everything was very conditional, right? So like I got attention or love or anything because if I was performing or doing a certain way, it wasn't just unconditional. We just love you no matter what. We give you attention no matter what. It was like I had to fight for that attention. So that unworthiness and like, am I enough? Why isn't anyone paying attention to me? And it, it really transpired into later when I really had an understanding of what was going on. I don't know if it was still going on, you know, later into my teens. Um, my parents had, you know, reconciled by then. But I had so much anger built up by then because I realized you did this and you and mom might have made up, but where was my apology? You didn't. And I, I'm sure I said this because I was a very mouthy kid. You didn't just cheat on mom. You cheated on me too. You cheated on us. Where's my apology? 
you know, so it was, it was very much a family thing that happened, but no one paid attention to that. It wasn't just between them, you know, especially that I had an awareness. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. Two things. I just want to ask you based on what you said, first of all, how, how did that impact your siblings also? Like what, and I'm talking about before you even knew, like, what did, they, did they interpret it the same way? They're not enough as well. Like, let's just, let's, I want to find out what happened with them first. And then I'll ask you the next question. Yeah. My, um, my, one of my older siblings rebelled very young, um, you know, losing virginity at a very young age, turned to drugs. Um, just doing very rebellious things, always sneaking out, got into trouble. And I'm sure that was like an attention seeking behavior, right? Because even negative attention gets attention. Um, and it just, it led to that behavior too, because I think a lot of people just weren't paying attention at the time. Um, I was the people pleaser. So I was, I'm smack dab in the middle of the birth order. And then my younger siblings, um, you know, they're both boys and they very much just always tried to get the attention with sports and, you know, very good looking boys. So just getting a lot of attention from girls and stuff too. And everything was so surfaced. I realized everything was very surfaced with them growing up. There weren't a lot of talk about feelings and emotions and no one was interacting with them that way. So that that's kind of how they became too, you know? Yeah. And you could really see how just based on this misinterpretation and this belief that's formed because they didn't know what else to grab. So this was the, this was exactly. The so now bring us to the, the time where now you knew something was, you know, something was going on, whether, you know, when you saw your dad, how did that, so how did that affect, did it change the interpretation that you, that you created or the beliefs that were created beforehand or what happened next with your mom, with your dad yeah. and you? As, as I got older and I started to really realize like what happens so now, maybe what early high school, late middle school. And I had this awareness of, of love and marriage and boyfriend and girlfriend and being aware of the opposite sex myself and all this and what that means. And I became very angry and I started to hate my dad. Um, because once I realized what happened and realized the affairs happened and the cheating, um, I became super cold to him. I hated him. I, I didn't care at all. Um, what he did, what he said, everything was a liar. He, he was a liar about everything. And, and he let me too. He didn't, there was no like, no, I'm going to try and tell. And I, I literally remember him saying to me one day, um, you know, I already apologized and I said, I was sorry. How many more times do you want me to say that? And I remember thinking at a, at a young age, like what you just stop, you keep saying it until I'm accepting of it, I guess. I don't know. Like you don't ever stop saying it to me then because there's still a problem wrong, but he was so like wrapped up in, in, in himself. But that experience of him me not feeling worthy enough, like what, I wasn't a good enough kid to keep you here at home. Like I wasn't enough to stop you. You didn't love me enough that you saw someone else. Cause now you have this awareness, right? Now you have this maturity. And I, and I kept coming up of like, well, you didn't love me enough to look at her and be like, Nope, I'm not going to go there because I have these beautiful kids at home and I love them. And I don't want my daughter to experience this or whatever. Like I wasn't enough to keep you there. Mom wasn't, but I wasn't too. Yeah. You know, and then I, it just got so cold. And then when people did try to love me, when I did find an amazing boyfriend in high school, it was great until I was like, no, this is too good. I better ruin it before he ruins me. Wow. And it's so easy to see how that can happen. Now, what about your siblings? Did, did he, did your dad give the same response to your siblings or did they not even expect an apology? What, what happened with them? You know, that's funny you ask that because no one ever really dove in like I did. Mm. No one was, no one, I went to therapy. I started therapy as soon as I could. Um, I think I started around like 19 or 20 and no one else did. Everyone else just kind of lifted the rug, swept it under and just put it on. And for some reason I had awareness around it. I was not okay with anything. I was not okay with band-aids. I've never been okay with band-aids. Um, 
And I was always the problem child. You know, I'm sure he was never happy with me because I just never stayed quiet. I, oh, I always spoke up with things. Um, but yeah, no one else talked about it really, but we knew about it. But, and I talk about it with my siblings now, you know, and how much it affects them and things that they've realized and stuff. But um, yeah, no one talked about it but me. And I, I always find it very interesting how it hits each child a little bit different. Oh, sure. Isn't it amazing? Because each child is so different and it makes sense that it would mm -hmm. hit them differently too. So how did you look at your mom or your mom's response? Like what was your mom's response to your, you know, to your dad? And then how, how did you see that play out with you? Like, tell me that dynamic. Yeah. So my response to my mom, well, my mom's response to it all, um, was all based on like what he told her. It was very much, um, no one will ever want you with all these kids, you know, what are you going to do? Leave me? You know, that was always in the beginning. And so she responded to that and was like, oh yeah, he, he must be right. That I, I can't, I can't leave you. You must be right. Um, and his parents actually offered to pay for their divorce to get her out wow. and she wouldn't do it. So it's just, it just goes to show like the conditioning and what you believe, what you're told over time and time again. And then, and then you cut other people off, you know, so now you're really isolated. It, it's, a, it's a cycle of abuse, you know, and um, she just took it and accepted it. And then, you know, somewhere along the, the way, I know my dad found God, um, I find that happening a lot and he got like uber religious, but it went to an extreme, you know? And so that was enough, I guess, to satisfy my mom of like, well, now I don't have to get divorced. Now I don't have to go anywhere. Um, I don't have to find a job and working because my mom always stayed home. So, oh, he's sorry. Okay. And then she just accepted the shitty behavior, right. you know, the bare minimum. Well, at least he's here. Well, at least he says he's faithful now and. As far as I know, it stopped after, you know, I was probably like mid high school by then, maybe younger, maybe it st stopped younger than that. And then she just lived for the bare relationship, bare minimum in that relationship. And, and I viewed her, I also got very frustrated with her. Um, as a child, I was very protective. So as a child watching my mom go through this, I had my mom's side. You know, I was like very had my mom's back. I was worried. I was concerned. I was always there. And my mom did the best she can, you know, to, you know, just there. And then as I got older, I was like, you are so weak. You are so weak. And I found this inner internal resentment going against her. But I'm grateful for it because it shaped me in a way, because I was like, I will never become that. I will never become weak and vulnerable and fully reliant on a man. And um, I'm grateful for those viewpoints, but I, I, it turned to anger of like, how could you let someone do that to you? How could you not protect us? And then the older I got, and then as I became a mother, I realized here, I thought I had all these daddy issues. It was a lot of mom issues of like, how did you, how could you not protect me from that? How could you not get us out of that? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been interesting watching myself, you know, transform and heal through this journey all because of the, what happened when I was a child. Isn't that amazing? It, it's like you become who you are, you know, in spite of, because of, I mean, there are so many things I grew up with where I was like, I am so never doing that because of what I mm -hmm. learned. And it absolutely made no sense. But, but it's, it's really true. It puts you, it puts you in a tough spot because here are your parents and you're supposed to be looking at them a certain way, but you see they're, they're very human and making decisions that at their current level of consciousness, that was the best they could do for whatever reason. Right. But with your mom, you could really, you know, when you, when you really boil it down, it's like it all it all rests on our beliefs because your mom believed this is the best she could do. So she better just find a way to be okay with it. Where if she realized, you know, if she decided, made some different choices about what she wanted to believe, it could have created a, a, a completely different path, but that may not have helped you become who you are as well. So, so it's so interesting. 
all right, so now mm -hmm. here you are, you're looking at your mom a certain way, you're looking at your dad a certain way. From there, you assess kind of who you want to be, but you're dealing with all this anger, dealing with just all these decisions to make about, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? You know, what do I want to accept, tolerate, not all of it. What did mm -hmm. you do? Like, what were some of the changes you made or what were some of the shifts you made? Well, I wish I could say I did it earlier on after I started therapy and before I became a mom or even while I was a mom, but I didn't, I still didn't have the awareness. And unfortunately I married my dad. Um, and I didn't see that until I was going through my divorce. And that's very common. We marry one of our parents and we keep that going. Um, and I just, and, and he didn't cheat on me. I'm not saying that about him. Um, that was one thing that I, I didn't experience in my marriage was an affair or anything like that. But the way he spoke to me, the very emotionally unavailable, um, hard, kind of cold love, yeah. the same that my dad showed me and us, <laughs> I got that same exact thing. Um, and amazing? then as I we, grew, we do that because not because it's good, because it's so familiar. We're like, Oh, I know how to, yeah. I know how this works. So we keep choosing yeah. the same partners, the same ideas, you know, these, and it's these opportunities that look like people to teach us something. And it sounds like after that marriage, you kind of got it like something shifted or you really learned something powerful. What'd you learn? Yeah, <laughs> I definitely learned I did not deserve bare minimum. And I learned that this cycle, even with or without betrayal of how you're treated as a woman, the respect that you deserve, the love that you deserve, what it can look like, that cycle was going to continue on if I didn't break it. And, you know, I was married for 17 years. And the last five of those years, I got into therapy again, I really started working and shaping and changing my body and my mindset and how those two things went together. And that opened my eyes to, I'm changing, I'm growing, I'm seeing my worth for the very first time. And it's not here. Mm -hmm. And the more I worked on loving myself, the more I saw my own value. Um, because it's crazy. If you don't love you, you can't expect someone else to give that to you and fill your cup. You have to fill your cup first. And that awareness and, and awareness doesn't always have to end a marriage, you know, that we had our own unique situation. Um, but that awareness and that growth led me to continue to grow and to be a role model for my kids and to break the cycle and to teach them at a young age, their worth and their value. Um, and I'm, I've always been very open and honest with them because I felt like a lot was hid from me as a child and I had to figure out and put together the pieces. Um, so I'm very honest with them about a lot of things, but that, that growth inside, not just physical and losing weight and all that, it's the growth on the inside is what changed me. Um, and I, I'm very lucky that I realized I needed this growth because unfortunately my siblings didn't. Um, and betrayal has been a big part of all of their relationships, oh. which kills me. Yeah. Um, but if and you don't do the work, it. that cycle will yeah, happen. That's, that's what they learned and they stayed with it where you learned it and you had enough examples and you said, I want to do something different. And, you know, mm -hmm. first of all, those of you who are on audio, you have to see Melissa. I think you're like a fitness model or something. I mean, she's like a rock star, <laughs> so, right? So clearly you've embodied this idea of strong body, strong mind, like, and, and there's yeah. something so much to that where the, when you do feel good about the physical, it helps the mental and emotional. It just does. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I was a trainer in 1991. <laughs> so, so long ago. Um, and I remember working out with somebody and she was going through a divorce and I'll never forget. She said, Debbie, I want to become stronger so I can better navigate my divorce. Like I'll never forget. That was the, the tie and the link she made. So let's go there. Tell us the link. What's the link you see between that physical strength and that mental, emotional strength? Yeah. Oh God. It's so under discussed. It's not even funny. And people always think physical, 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 like 
going through a divorce, going through really hard things. I just need to get to the gym and work it out and, and lose weight and do all that stuff. And that's great. But that link to the mental health, like when you get strong mentally as well as physically at the same time, you're unstoppable. And that's because when you love yourself and you have that self-respect and that self-worth, you show up for you no matter what. And you show up for you in a whole different way. It's it's insane because I've done the work physically and have gone to the classes and, and taught and lifted and done all of the things without doing the work in my heart and in my head. And sure, you get results, but it's like it's pulling teeth. And if life events happen, you stop. You stop. When you have that self-love, you're like, oh, yeah, that's going on. That that sucks. But I'm still going to the gym. You prioritize yourself in a whole new way. And everyone's always like, well, what's the secret? Where? How do I get motivated? You know, and I'm like, do the work on the inside. Because when you have high self-value and high self-worth, you feel worthy of going to the gym. You feel worthy enough to not eat the crappy food, you know, and I'm not saying that I don't, and there's balance for everything, but like, I'll look at things and I'm like, eh, I'm hitting my goals. I, I'm, I'm actually too good for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually too good for that pizza or, or whatever, but nothing stops me now. When I went through my divorce, oh man, I was like, okay, what's my fitness goal through this? How do I keep working on me physically? You know, because I know my worth. I know that my time, I hold it sacred. And you can't just do that overnight. You have to practice that over and over again. You know, what's really motivating me? What's really going to get me there? And I'm sorry, but saying I want to lose 30 pounds or 10 pounds or whatever, it's not enough. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not enough. Bringing, I love that you're bringing this up because I've even seen when, uh, when I was in health, someone would lose, let's say 20, 30 pounds but if the mental and emotional didn't catch up, be, like let's say they lost this weight and now they're getting more attention or all of a sudden they have a new wardrobe or now things that they didn't have access to, they did. Whatever changed because of mm-hmm. the weight, because things do change. You're just, you know, you were, maybe it was okay to kind of sit on the bleachers and now you want to be in the ring, whatever it is. And, and I'll never forget how, if they didn't allow the mental and emotional to catch up, they would sabotage their weight loss because they just, it just wasn't, it would freak them out that new look, that new way. And so I remember with one, uh, one person I was working with, we, we created base camp and base camp was this like week of getting settled into your new body. Mm -hmm. So your mind and your emotions can catch up. And I know it sounds for, for a lot of people, it sounds so crazy, but it's, but I know you get it because it's that the physical is so important, but the mental and emotional is equally as important, if not even more so. And if they're not Mm -hmm. kind of aligned, if they're not growing at the same pace, one may sabotage another. Does that make sense to you? Oh, completely. And People don't realize that there literally has to be like this identity shift that happens because we identify ourselves with our childhood, our past, our environment, you know, our family values and and all that and like, or an illness that we're carrying, you know, we identify that. And so for me, if I always identified as a, you know, a child from a broken family affair, you know, like woe is me type thing. I would not be able to identify as a powerful, strong, independent, confident woman today. You know, I, and I, I see family members who didn't take that path and that identity shift that I'm a strong fit mom. That's, that's just who I am. And now other people see me as that, like, oh yeah, Melissa, that's her identity. If that doesn't happen along with it, it's scary being in a body that you don't recognize. That's why when people want to lose weight, like let's say 20 pounds, mm-hmm. I'm like, great. Our goal is five pounds. You want to be 130, you know, and you weigh a lot more than that. Great. We're just going to take five pounds off. And they're like, no, no, no. But my goal is this. Uh, uh-uh. You have to learn how to be 165. And then you have to learn how to be 160 very, very slow. Like whenever I even let people into my program, 
we literally take a whole month, kind of like what you were describing of building the car before you enter the race. I don't even let people in anymore. And this is something I've learned over the few, the years that I've been doing this um, with my program is like, we're going to build this car. You're going to take it slow. You're going to learn. And then I'm going to let you join the race with everyone else. And that, that helps, that helps them learn. It helps them not get scared. Um, and when you change and you become different, or if you're that kid, that's got the loud voice, always speaking up and you're kind of the black sheep, you know, if you're not strong enough to handle that, that will shut you down. Now that, that will make you step back, be like, oh my God, I'm different now. Oh my and God. Really, you know, like, yeah. And, and it's a real difference. I mean, when transformation is real, it's, it's like, it's just who you become. So what mm-hmm. do you say to that person? Cause because I'm always trying to get into the minds of my listeners and viewers. They're like, well, that sounds really nice. I- I'm either coming from, you know, a, a family of betrayal or I've been betrayed myself. And now I feel mm-hmm. horrible. I don't even know the first place, the first place to begin. I hear what she's saying and all, and it sounds nice. And I would love to become healthier and more fit. What is speak to that person? What is the first thing he or she should do? Oh, move your body, move your body. And I don't say that because like, oh, then you'll start losing weight and you'll be more calories or burn more calories. Like, no, no, no. When you move, you literally make a chemical difference in your muscles, your joints, and your brain. You start producing the right endorphins and chemicals and balancing your hormones for females that are going to make you start to feel better. If you lay on the couch and or your bed and you give up, you are making that problem worse. And you will continue to say, I don't know if I can do this. I don't even know what the first step is. So there, there's so much power in just a walk. You feel like crap. You, you've been hurt. Someone's hurting you. You've hurt other people. Move your body. Get a clear head. Like literally taking steps is the first step to do. <laughs> No, I love that. The second? And I, and I, it's, it makes so much sense because even, you know, in the case of betrayal, for example, it's, your life has been completely upended. Things are completely out of your control. And what you eat, how you move may be the only things you have control over. So it's a, it's a really good place to start. It, mm-hmm. What do you want everybody to know as we wrap up? You have this inner beast and this inner goddess that deserves to be loved and nurtured and they're just dying to come out. And sometimes they get masked and pushed and stuffed away because of the hurt and the pain that we have gone through, that we have experienced, and we haven't done the work to bring them out. And I'm telling you right now, everyone deserves to be great no matter what you've gone through, no matter what someone else has done to you, whether they're sorry for it or not. Once you take control and you get to know and learn and feed that beast inside, they will come out. And that is the life that you deserve to live. And you can overcome anything. I have been to the pits of hell and back. And I didn't even recognize myself during that time. And I'm telling you, The more you keep working on you, even if it's just a walk a day, you will start to feed that beast. They will start to slowly come out. And the more time and attention you give yourself and remove other people, other people have to do their own journey and their own healing. I had to learn how to remove my parents from the equation and and know that they only know what they know. They're doing the best they can with the tools that they have. And if they don't want to learn and sharpen and pick up new tools, that's on them. I can't let that hold me back. So sometimes that happens with a partner or significant other. So keep focusing on you. Keep learning that inner beast and never, ever stop moving your body. It's the worst thing that you could do. I love that. Melissa, you helped so many people with your wisdom, with your insight. And what I love so much is that when we take our trauma and do something good with it, that's trauma well served. And it sounds like here you came from a situation and you would have had every reason to stay sick, sad, stuck, small, all of it. And instead you looked and you said, you know, mm-mm, not going to do it. Not going to do that for myself, for my kids and for all the people you serve. So thank you so much for your wisdom. I know you shared so much with us today. Oh, thank you for having me on.
And before I even go, I totally forgot. Where do we go to learn more about you and what you do? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Go to my website. It's Melissa Vogel fitness.com. It's Melissa Vogel. You'll find me all over TikTok, Instagram, everywhere, Facebook. So yeah, come check it out. Perfect. Thanks so much. I hope you loved hearing about Melissa's journey of overcoming childhood betrayal, breaking free from toxic cycles and finding strength both inside and out as a powerful reminder that no matter where we start, we all have the ability to rewrite our story. Stay in touch with Melissa by going to itsmelissavogel.com and we'll have all of her information in the show notes at thepbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. We always have a decision about what we'll do with the cards we're dealt. We can use them to justify certain behaviors or we can use them as an amazing example of what not to do. When we do that, we break the chain and we're stronger, better, and wiser for it. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with someone who'd benefit from hearing this message. Until next time, keep moving forward, stay strong, and remember, you are worthy of the life you want to create. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.